medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. We're going to talk today about sleep and diet. And we like to think about these things in a linear fashion, how one affects the other, but both affect each other. And we're going to talk about two studies, one study in which diet affects sleep, and then another study about how sleep can actually affect our diet. And this could actually be a vicious cycle where bad diets can cause bad sleep and bad sleep can cause more bad diets. So we'll see how we can actually stop that cycle. So first, let's talk about how diet can affect sleep. So this is a hypnogram. And what we're looking at is what happens when somebody goes to sleep. As it turns out, we have a number of stages here that I want to talk to you about. We have the stage of awakening, and you can see that right there where the patient is starting off. And then we have something called REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. It is a special type of sleep where you actually dream. We won't get into that too much. And then there's four stages of sleep. And actually, they've combined this into three stages where you have stage one or N1. You have stage two, which is N2. And then three and four have been combined into N3. And this N3 is actually very important because it's where you get something called slow wave sleep. Slow wave sleep is very important in terms of physical restorative sleep. It's also involved in memory consolidation in some cases, but specifically it's also associated with the secretion of growth hormone, which is a very important hormone, especially in adolescents and teenagers, but also as you get on in life. It was once thought that growth hormone was the hormone of the fountain of youth. So it helps you grow, makes you feel better, well-rested. So really what we want to do is maximize slow-wave sleep if possible. And anything we can do to increase that is helpful. As we get older, slow-wave sleep tends to go away. So notice here that we have stage one sleep, which is sort of a transition stage, very minimal stage one sleep throughout the night. Stage two, unfortunately, as we get older, that is the one that we have more and more of. And it's really kind of just sleep without a lot of good benefits, it seems. And then we've got REM sleep, which is mentally restorative, generally speaking, and stage three and four, which is N3 sleep, which is physically restorative. Let's talk a little bit more about slow wave sleep. This was a study that was published back in 2008 titled Slow Wave Sleep and the Risk of Type 2 Diabetes in Humans. And what they showed is when they suppressed slow wave sleep or this N3 sleep, especially in young, healthy adults, what it showed was that there was a marked decrease in insulin sensitivity. And this led to reduced glucose tolerance and increased diabetes risk. Oftentimes, when I talk about dietary studies, people have a hard time believing that diabetes could be caused by anything else other than ingestion of sugars. There are so many things that can increase the risk of diabetes. Sleep, we have studies that show that increased exposure to sunshine and being outside can actually reduce the incidence of diabetes. Here we show that a reduction in slow wave sleep at night can increase the incidence of insulin resistance and therefore diabetes. And so diabetes and insulin resistance is much more than just dietary carbohydrates. And we'll show you the studies in the links in the description below. You can see here, after just three nights of slow-wave sleep suppression, we can see that insulin sensitivity goes down and that glucose tolerance also goes down after just three nights of slow-wave sleep suppression. So let's talk about unhealthy diets. Now, this was a paper that was just published this year, actually just recently here in May 2023, and it's titled, Exposure to a More Unhealthy Diet Impacts Sleep Microstructure During Normal Sleep and Recovery Sleep, a Randomized Trial. So this was an interesting study that took 15 subjects that were healthy in every way. They were not taking any medication. They had a normal body mass index, generally speaking, had a normal waist circumference, had stable weight, hadn't changed in the past six months, and they also reported a regular sleep-wake pattern with sleep duration 7 to 9.25 hours per night and a regular daily meal pattern with three main meals. And this study was actually pretty well designed. 15 randomized subjects, and you think 15 is not that much, but in fact, each subject acted as their own control. So what really increases the power of this study is the fact that they were randomized and it was a crossover trial. What they were randomized to was a high-fat, high-sugar diet on one side and a low-fat, low-sugar diet on the other side. 
If you want more information about exactly what diet this was, they break it down for you very explicitly in the study. They listed out exactly what percentage of calories was related to fats, sugars, proteins, etc. And they did this for seven days. So they were randomized to one or the other. And then they flipped after a seven-week washout. They went to a low-fat, low-sugar diet on this side and a high-fat, high-sugar diet on this side. So in other words, they acted again as their own controls. Low-fat, low-sugar, high-fat, high-sugar for seven days. And they went into the lab and they looked specifically at these different phases of sleep. These meals were isocaloric based on their weight. So these meals were specifically designed for the subjects. They was given to them and they had to document how much they ate and take a picture of it and send it back. So it was not a questionnaire. Strictly controlled study. You can see here that the low fat, low sugar diet was 2624 calories and the high fat, high sugar was 2622. So exactly the same on average across the board, but it was specifically designed for that subject. And you can see the studies for the specifics. It was isochloric for each individual using the Harris Benedict equation and factored individually for the estimated habitual physical activity exercise that they were reporting that they were doing extremely well-designed crossover randomized trial. So let's see what they found. Looking again at the amount of slow wave sleep. Now you can get slow wave sleep in N3. You can get slow wave sleep in N2, although it's not as high. And of course, in total in non-REM, which is all together. If we look at the number of slow waves in N2, as you can see here, it's pretty low in general. So you're not going to see a lot. And it's much higher, generally speaking, in N3. If we want to look at the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude, in other words, what's the height of the waves of slow wave sleep, what you will see here is that there was a statistically significant difference between those on the low fat and high fat. Low fat was in blue and high fat is in orange. So in the low fat, there was actually a statistically significantly higher amount of slow wave sleep in the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude as shown here, especially as measured in the central leads on the EEG. They also found in N2 sleep, there was a statistically significant increase in the duration of those slow waves in N2 sleep, especially as measured in the frontal lobes. So what do they say about this? The unhealthier, high-fat, high-sugar diet that we used here in indeed provided almost twice the percentage of calories from fat and sugar and almost five times the percentage of calories from saturated fats compared with the low-fat, low-sugar diet. On the high-fat, high-sugar diet, the percentage of calories that participants obtained from fat, which was 44%, and saturated fat, which was 18.6%, slightly exceeded the average reported 36% and 12% respectively, and the recommended daily intake proportions, 20% to 35% and less than 10% respectively, for U.S. citizens in the 2015 to 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. The percentage of calories from sugar was, however, less than the average daily intake across the U.S. age groups. So it was about 17.6 versus 19 to 23%. So it's possible that an even unhealthier diet, and that means a diet higher in sugar, may have resulted in even greater diet-induced differences in, for example, sleep delta power. So delta power on sleep is, again, slow-wave sleep. So in other words, the unhealthy diet that we had in this study wasn't even as unhealthy as the standard American diet. So in conclusion, they said, we here and provide novel evidence to indicate that exposure to a more unhealthy diet, higher in proportion of daily calories from sugar and fat, can impact several sleep parameters that are known to be associated with restorative properties of sleep in humans. As we also observe, similar changes in sleep parameters during recovery sleep, which occurred after cessation of the two different diets, our findings raise the possibility that even a short-term dietary exposure, like they did here in the study, can continue to impact the neurobiology of sleep over several days. So here we can clearly see where diet can impact your ability to have a good night's sleep. Let's quickly look at another study that completes that circuit. Here is a study that was published titled, A Single Night of Moderate At-Home Sleep Restriction Increases Hunger and Food Intake in Overweight Young Adults. So these were adults that were a little bit more overweight, so BMI around 27.5. Again, 15 overweight adults. And the first night of sleep was a regular sleep routine where they went to bed at 11.30 at night, got up at 7.30 the next morning. And then finally, the second night was this restricted sleep, six hours in bed, and they slept from three to nine o'clock in the morning. 
What happened the next day? Energy intake was increased the next day, highly statistically significant p-value there, with increased fat and protein intakes, both statistically significant, and feelings of hunger that were statistically significant. Not only that, but because they did not get a good night's sleep, systolic blood pressure was higher and heart rate was faster the next morning. Here's a situation where you could have a bad night's sleep, and this could lead to poor dietary changes, which, as we've just found out, can impact the next night's sleep. So essentially, bad night's sleep leads to worsening diet. Clearly, we need to be working on both getting a good diet and a good night's sleep. I would be remiss if I did not tell you that at medcram.com, we have a number of courses that look at, for instance, sleep apnea, which can certainly impact your sleep, insomnia, and also optimal health and immunity explained clearly. If you have difficulty with insomnia, I highly recommend viewing this course. We have a newly updated sleep apnea course with over 208 reviews, five out of five stars, and it also is available for continuing medical education credits. So come over to medcram.com, subscribe, turn on notifications, and give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Thanks for joining us.